Good morning. Welcome to worship. Let's stand together. Psalm 35, 27. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Let's honor the Lord this morning. Come people of the risen King. Lift it up together. season we can think of so many reasons to be grateful and to rejoice and to be thankful before him let's count our blessings as we sing this old hymn together when upon us billows
so amid the conflict. Continue our hearts and minds towards worship, thinking about our Thanksgiving week that we are approaching, the season that we are approaching. I turn to uh, a familiar psalm, Psalm 118, uh, verses 1 through 9. I want to read those nine verses for us before we jump in. The scripture says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is Better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And so as we think about this idea of giving thanks, and giving thanks particularly, as the Scripture says, for the steadfast love of the Lord. That word steadfast there means loyal. And I, I can't think of a better reason to give thanks for that loyal love that God has for us. So I want to begin there this morning. Father, we're grateful this morning for your steadfast, your loyal love in our life. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that we can pause this moment to give honor and give praise. And Father, we come with a thankful heart this morning. Father, we thank you that this morning that we, in our thanksgiving, can give you worship through that. And may our thanksgiving always be worshipful. But I also want to ask you this morning, and this will tie into our message have you given thanks to the Lord for things that are not going your way? And what I mean by that is in those things, in those difficult circumstances of our life, when things are hard, those are opportunities for God to show his faithfulness. And for that, and during those times, we give thanks. Lord, I'm grateful today that in the midst of the chaos in the midst of uncertainties that we face each and every day. Lord, that every situation that we find ourselves that bring anxiety, that bring worry, Lord, they are an opportunity for you to demonstrate your faithfulness. Lord, you have done it in the past. You are doing it today and you will do it forevermore, Lord. And we give you thanks for working in such unique and intricate ways in our life. But I ask you guys this morning this, what are you trusting in? If we have a God who is holy, who is righteous, who is right, why do we seek the affections of another? Father, this morning we are grateful, Lord, that we can trust you because you are steadfast. Father, we acknowledge that you are a God who is holy, who is righteous, who is right, always having our best interest in mind. Lord, forgive us for when we have a wandering eye and a wandering heart. And may our affections be solely upon you. And so this morning, Lord, we repent. But Lord, we also give thanks for your steadfast love endures forever. And Father, for that, we are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. You just remain seated as we give thanks before the Lord.
let's stand together as we sing this chorus with her. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Lift them up. Sing this great hymn of our faith together. Wonderful new reasons to uh, give thanks. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river. When peace is like a Is it well with your soul this morning? Let's look forward. Taste the day.
Church of God, sing together. It is well. this to the Lord as we worship. It is well. It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul. Father, we are so grateful morning we can declare it is well with us Lord thank you for your faithfulness for how you provide for us each and every day and you remind us it is well thank you for the peace that that provides and I pray Father that we would live in that this day in Jesus name Amen
Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for clapping. And I'm going to leave it there. You guys are a little bit more awake than the first crowd was this morning. <clears throat> and, you know, you hate to be that guy that, like, starts it all, too. Like, jumping up and down, clapping. I had to calm Richard down because he was about to jump over the balcony so excited this morning. Y'all, if you hadn't figured out, uh, I, I don't take myself real seriously, so it's okay to laugh, have fun. We're here, to, we're here to enjoy each other's company, but we're here to enjoy the Lord as well this morning. Philippians chapter 4, being anxious is literally, <clears throat> they tell us, an epidemic in America. Matter of fact, the New York Post several years ago has labeled this generation as the anxious generation. And if the New York Post wasn't bad enough, the New York Times across town called us, uh, called the idea of being anxious and labeled it American-itis. We have adopted that as our own disease, American-itis. And so last weekend, we jumped into a series called Finding Peace in the Savior. It's going to be a three-week sermon series. This is week two of that series, uh, Finding Peace in the Savior. And what I want to do before we really jump into the new content this morning, I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing where we were last week, okay? Because I believe last week and this week are so connected that if you don't know what we said last week, you could have a hard time catching up this week. And if you haven't heard, and I want to encourage you to go back online, uh, firstbaptistellisville.com, and during the media section there, you can listen and watch last week's sermon. I strongly encourage you to do so. But last weekend, we asked two basic questions. The first question was, what does it mean to be anxious? And again, to clarify, we're not talking about a medical diagnosis or that's a mental illness of anxiety, but we're talking about a fleshly response to things in our lives that can be dealt with through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And I gave you a definition of being anxious, and here's the definition that I gave you. It is fearful concern experienced when life's demands seem greater than my ability to meet them. Basically, it's our response to of a fearful concern to the situations and the circumstances of our life when it appears that that situation or that circumstance is greater than our resources and our ability to meet that particular need. But we also differentiated between a uh, genuine concern but also a fearful concern. Because what we're not saying is, is that we shouldn't have any concerns at all whatsoever. That's not what we're saying here at all. But a genuine concern is what we would call a burden. And, and what that burden does is that it expresses itself in dependence on God. And it asks the question, what will he do, meaning God, in that situation? And so when I have a circumstance or a situation in my life that seems greater than my capacity to meet that situation, genuine concern, what it does is that it drives me to my loving relationship with my heavenly Father and to be able to pour out my concerns and to pour out our burdens and trust that God is in control and I can trust Him in the midst of that challenging situation. But fearful concern is just the opposite. Fearful concern is when that situation arises and I become anxious and that begins to express itself on dependence on self and it asks the question, how am I going to fix this situation? Not what are you going to do, God? How are you going to work in this particular situation? But how am I going to figure it out? How am I going to get out of this situation? And what happens is, is that that becomes an all-consuming desire rather than challenges in my life being invitations to deeper intimacy with God. The struggles of my life uh, become temptations for me to run from God, to run away from Him and look to myself to figure out how I'm going to deal with that situation. So do you see the difference there? And that's when we, the, that's when this thing of being anxious that Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 4 verses 6, what he's writing about becomes a reality in our lives. In last Sunday, I asked you a second question. And the second question was this, why should I not be anxious? 
And if you remember, I gave you five reasons why we should not be anxious. Now, I'm not going to preach that whole sermon to you, but I do want to go through those briefly again. The first reason is that being anxious is not pleasing to God. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, nothing. Second of all, being anxious endangers my health physically and spiritually. And we remember, we looked at a long laundry list of damaging effects that worry and anxiety can have on our life. Thirdly, being anxious is inconsistent with the character of God. If God is who he says he is, and we believe that, what in the world are we being anxious about? All right? Number four, being anxious misrepresents the character of God to those around us. When you and I, as Christians, are living with worry and living with stress and, and anxiety, it misrepresents the character of God to unbelievers who are around us, who are watching our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But fifthly, being anxious doesn't change anything for the good. And we talked about it. It, does, it creates no value whatsoever. It does not change anything. And so that's where we came from last week. And I want to jump back in with the third question of this series that I teased you with a little bit last week. And here's the third question. How do I keep from being anxious in my life? Because if we're all going to be honest, every one of us in this room, this is an area of temptation for every one of us. Now, some of you, it's more obviously more so than others. But the one thing about our flesh, our fallen nature, is that all of us have one of those. The difference is each of us has propensities to one thing or to another. Not everybody is going to struggle in the same way. We're all going to have struggles, but each of us has a flesh that is based on experience, based on what we've been taught, based on, um, uh, based on what we've been through, based on our wiring, based on our family, based on our heritage, based on a, a thousand different things begin to affect that. Our flesh is bent in one way or another, and all of us are going to struggle with this, but some of you are obviously infinitely more prone to it than others. And as we said last weekend, just because you are a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you're immune from stressful and difficult situations. Can I get amen? Amen. There we go. One of the reasons a lot of Christians struggle with this issue is because they think this shouldn't happen to them because they are a Christian. That's not true at all. Scripture never tells us that. The Bible actually says just the opposite. As a Christian, you and I will face challenging and difficult circumstances and situations. This is not true just for those of us who are Christians, but this is something that all of human nature has to deal with. When we chose in the garden, when we, had a, we as human beings began uh, being sinned against God, what happened there is that we lost the ability to have a relationship with God. And the damaging impact <clears throat> of the fall is that you and I now have to battle this thing called anxiety and worry. Because of this, because of this as being a human problem and not just a Christian problem, human beings, what have we done? We've tried to figure it out all by ourselves, and it's gotten us nowhere. So I've got a couple of examples for you. <clears throat> for example, there's a website called Healthline.com. Some of you may know about that website. But on that website, they claim to be the fastest-growing health information website on planet Earth. That's some pretty wild claims there, right? <clears throat> and when you look at the, who these people are, these folks, it's a lot of people with medical and even science degrees and when you go to their About Us page, this is what they say about themselves. We're human just like you. We know that peace of mind can make all the difference in how you feel. So we'll be here to help you when you need us. Now, doesn't that just make you feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside? I, I just feel better just reading that statement. I just feel good now, right? So they had on their website an article. And there's a lot of neat things on that article, a lot of uh, website. There's a lot of uh, uh, helpful things. I'm not disparaging them. But when it comes to the issue of being anxious, they had this article called 16 Simple Ways to Relieve Stress and Anxiety. And here's number three. Number three, light a candle. Okay. So when we dig down into the depths of who we are, when we come up with, we come up with some real great stuff. You got a problem today? Here's an invitation to light a candle. 
We're going to have candles right down here in just a little while so that you guys will feel better about yourselves. Just light a candle and you'll feel better. You think that's funny? Look at number six on the list. Chew gum. I'm not making this up, I promise. It's, it's right there off the list. And some of you are chewing gum right now, and you already feel better than the rest of us in the room. <laughs> you do. So to be honest, the list didn't help me out a whole lot. Okay? So I moved on. There's a website called BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed had 16 little ways to keep anxiety from ruining your life. Now, what I'm about to show you is literally the way they put it on their website. This is not a joke. This is serious. This is literally number 12. Roll it. Imagine yourself taking off your anxiety glasses and giving yourself a break. Now, in the first service, we could not make a decision if it's GIF or GIF. What is it? GIF or GIF? Help me out. GIF, GIF. GIF like the peanut butter? Why don't they spell it J-I-F then? They spell it G-I-F. So anyway, that's another sermon for another day. But on the website, it actually, the cat is taking his glasses off and putting them off and on. I can only get the freeze frame going on there, so that's where I got him taking it off there. And they actually showed that. That's number 12. Imagine yourself taking off your anxiety glasses and giving yourself a break. But look at the next one, number 13. Schedule time for your anxiety. Okay, and then they show an iPhone there, and they show you exactly how you're supposed to do that on their iPhone. And I, and I really wish I was making this stuff up. And again, there are some very helpful things on that website. But seriously, come on. Let me just say something to you today. We have a much better source to turn to in situations and circumstances. We do. The one who made you down to the smallest part of who you are. The one who spoke you into existence wrote us a letter of how to deal with this stuff. Okay? Before I light my candle or before I chew my gum because of anxiety or I take my anxiety glasses off or, or, or schedule time for my anxiety, I would encourage you at least read the letter first. Okay? Okay? Let's start there. So let's start reading in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And we looked again at these verses last weekend. Starting in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, if you were here with us last weekend, that's as far as we got. We just dealt with this issue of being anxious for nothing. Why would he give us this command? Well, he gives us this command because anxiety and worry, it does not help us at all. It only hurts us. But now, we're going to look on what he says. Do not be anxious about anything, but... Stop right there. You're thinking... Preacher, if you go this piece, this pace, we'll be six months getting through this first, and you might be right. And I'm just playing. That word but there, that B-U-T, that's an important little word. It's a particle of antithesis is what that is. It's a particle of contrast. All right? It, it, it means here one option for us is that when those situations and those circumstances in your life are there, they're overwhelming and they're challenging you and beyond your control when they come up, here's one thing you can do. You can be anxious when those things come up. It's not going to give you anything of value whatsoever. It's not going to help you. It's only going to hurt you. And so you shouldn't do those things. But there is a temptation for us, though, right, to run straight to it, to run straight to that direction. And that Scripture says that's an option. But he says, but here's another option. That's what he's saying. Here's the other option. But in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which, sur which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad he didn't say go chew some gum? Aren't you glad this morning? We can be anxious, but what he's saying is there's a better alternative. In everything with prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And so what I want to do this morning is we want to unpack the four musts of finding peace in the Savior this morning. You can be anxious or you can have peace. How many of you today want to have peace? I want to have peace. So here's the first. The first must is this. I must know God. Very simply, I must know God. Listen to the verse. And the peace of God. Here's what it means. It's God's peace. He didn't say, and the peace from God. Did he? 
No, he said the peace of God. So it's literally God's peace, not mine. Understand that there are many here today in a room like this. You're already a follower of Jesus. It's the reason that you're at church today. It's, it's, you're here because you love Jesus and you desire for him to speak truth into your life today. And so what I'm about to do is I'm going to give you some principles from God's word that you can apply to your life as a follower of Jesus to help you deal with temptation and being anxious. But I also understand here today that some of you in this room are not followers of Jesus yet. You're not. Maybe you're hearing, maybe you're seeking, maybe you're asking questions, maybe a friend brought you, maybe a friend invited you today, but I'm going to go through several things this morning, and I'm going to give you several spiritual realities, and these, I believe, are worth writing down. And so here's the first reality. You cannot know the peace of God without knowing the God of peace. You cannot know the peace of God without knowing the God of peace. Until you know God, until you know God, the best you have apart from God is light a candle and chew some gum. That's the best that you have. That's the best you've got. But when you know God, you can draw on his strength and his peace in every moment of your life. The Bible teaches us, all of us, were made by God to know God, to love God, and to be known and to be loved by God. But every one of us in this room has sinned against God. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we are separated from God. God is a holy God and, 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 and will not be in fellowship with sin. And because of our sin, we're cut off from God and there is nothing on our own that we can do. Religion, morality, good works does not matter. We're already separated from God because of our sin. And if we die in that condition, we spend eternity separated from God. So apart from God, we come into this world, we live lives of sin against God, and we're on our own to deal with the issues. But here's the kicker. You ready? But God loves us too much to leave us that way. He loves us too much. The Bible says that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ is God's son who took on human flesh. He came into the world and he did what you and I couldn't do. He lived a perfectly sinless life. And on the cross, Jesus offered his body as a substitution, as a sacrifice for you and for me. He died on the cross in my place and in your place. He took all of our sin on himself and he died for us, but he did not stay dead, my friends. He rose again so that the testimony, the testimony that God had accepted his sacrifice for our sins so that we can put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ to be born again and to have a relationship with God. That is the gospel. And when you and I are facing those difficult and those challenges and those hard situations, you don't have to face them on your own, my friend. You can face them drawing on the strength and the peace of God who loves you ultimately. And if you're here today in this room and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never come to know God, that's step number one. Give it all to Jesus. Let him fill you. And Paul understood that. And we didn't read past Philippians 4, 6, and 7 there intentionally. But if you were to read down on in the chapter and skip down to verse 11, listen to what Paul says. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content, is what he says. Friends, that is a great verse. That's a great verse, and, and I hope that some of you, in your heart, in your heart, you are shouting amen over that verse. I hope that you are. Some of you may be not doing that, because in order to admit that, that means you don't have anything to complain about anymore. Verse 12 says it this way, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound, and in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance 
and need. Paul says, I have learned. And so now here Paul is about to let us in on something. The secret of placing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Man, what's, what's that secret? Well, it's in the next verse, verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's not about the situation and the circumstance I'm in. You hear me? It's not about the situation and the circumstance. It's who's in me that I'm facing the situation and circumstance with that makes all the difference. Henry Blackaby, when Christ lives in you, he brings every divine resource with him. Whew, that's good. Every time you face a need, you meet it with the presence of the crucified, risen, and triumphant Lord of the universe inhabiting you. So here's the first must. You must know God. None of the rest of what we're going to talk about is applicable to you if you do not know God. And for some of you today, if you don't know God, you don't know Jesus, when we get to the end of our service here in just a little while, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of worship at the end. We're going to sing and I'm going to be right down here in the front. And if you don't know Jesus today, I want to encourage you to to step out and and come out. And remember, uh, you're not going to get there on your own. So you need to step out. But God loves you and God is so sovereign that he has orchestrated that you are to be here today. That so he could come and he could inhabit you. So when we stand and sing in just a little bit, you come And you step out and you come to see me. And if you don't know Christ here today, you step down and you say, Pastor, I want to know Jesus. If you forget how to do that, just say Jesus and I'll I'll know what you're talking about, okay? I'm going to give you that opportunity here in just a little while. So the first must is this. We must or I must know God. Here's the second must. I must live my life in constant fellowship with God. So here's where a bunch of Christians, we get off track. You know, I've been talking to some non-Christians in the room for a moment, but here's where we as Christians seem to get off track. Well, I, I know God, but well, why don't I have peace? Hmm. I'm a Christian. I should have peace. Well, it's more than just knowing God. I must live my life in constant fellowship with God. Did you hear what Paul said here? Do not be anxious about anything but in prayer By prayer, that's what he says. Paul uses several words in this verse to describe our communication with God. He uses the word supplication. He uses the word request. But right here at this point, he uses the word prayer. The word prayer is the most general word in the Bible that we have that simply is talking with God. That's the word prayer. It speaks to our communication with God. And here's the problem. What we do as Christians is we always seem to tend to put God in a box. We got God in a box, in our church box. Oh, sure, for the last hour or so, we've, we've been here. We've got God out of the box. We've been talking to God. We pour our hearts out to God. We pray. The preacher there, even in the middle of the service, he stops and makes us pray. How dare him do that? That's too much out of the box. And so we talk to God. And then maybe if you're connected in a, in a Sunday school class or a small group, uh, you spent a little bit more time this morning connecting and you've had your bo- God out of his box here just a little bit longer. Maybe in the morning times you have 15 to 30 minutes in the morning where you take God out of his box and you're all alone with him. And you, you know, if you added all the time that we have in the, the church box, the small group box, and the devotional life box, it would add up to roughly 3% of your life. 3%. That means that 97% of our life happens after we've put God in the box. We go to the store. We go to the ball field. We face the challenges of life. We're dealing with family issues at night. We're walking through struggles. And the whole time God is tucked away in the box. And what Paul is teaching us here is if you and I are going to deal with the issue of being anxious The reason we're so anxious, instead of going to God with this stuff, we're looking to ourselves. How am I going to figure all of this out? When those challenges and those stressful situations should drive us to our intimacy with God. So Paul said here, do not be anxious for anything. But in everything, he says, 
This word everything here in the original language, you know what that means? Anybody want to try? Thank you, Joni. She was here for the first service. She knows the answer. <laughs> but she, she got it right the first time. It means everything. It's not real difficult there. It means what it says there. It comes from a root word that means the whole, but it also means every individual part too. So here's what that means. I don't have God just in my church box, my God time box, or my sprawl groom box. No, he is in every detail of my life. So when the circumstances come up that seem too difficult for you and I to handle, rather than dealing with it, rather than texting your friend, or rather, God forbid, we get on social media and complain about it, stop it. Go to the Father. That's what he's there for. Knowing the peace of God and the difficulties of life is discovered as I live my life in constant fellowship with God. But I want to be transparent here for you this morning, okay? Okay. Everything in my life rises and falls on my fellowship with God daily, moment by moment. And here's what I mean by that. When I'm with God in the morning and moment by moment, I carry those burdens of my heart to him. And you know what I found? All hell can break loose in my life and I can still enjoy the peace of God. I can still enjoy it. But listen to me. I just want to be honest with you this morning. When I'm not with Jesus in the morning and when I'm not with him moment by moment carrying those things to him, the slightest, the slightest little thing in my life can send me to some really dark places. Emotionally, mentally, Spiritually, I think that's all of us. We can all go there. And I don't want you to look up here and say, hey, that dude's got it all together because it's far from it. Far from it. Because when I'm not much with Jesus in the morning and when I'm not doing exactly what Paul is instructing us here to do today, when I'm not in every situation of my life carrying these things, my heart, my emotions, my mind, they can go to some really dark places. I must know God. I must live in constant fellowship with God. That is why the psalmist says, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. The third must is this. I must be honest with God about the cares and concerns of my life. So Paul uses some other words. He uses the word supplication. That's a word you've used 15 times this week, isn't it? Supplication. No, it's not. That word supplication is a word that means to make your need known. It's a request that arises from a, from a sense of need. It's the, the moments in life when life seems bigger than the capacity to meet that need. And Paul says we are to bring those things to the Father. But he also uses the word request. The word request is a petition. It's a very specific thing that you're asking for. So look back at that verse. It says, with thanksgiving, verse 6, let your request be made known or be known. It's a, it's a passive, present passive verb. It's why it's important. It's not you carrying this necessarily to God. You hear me? It's not you necessarily carrying it to God. It's inviting God into it. And there's a difference. Because if it's inviting, taking it to God, we may not tell the whole truth. We might not give it all, but when we invite God into it, he's all in the middle of it. Paul is telling us, instead of looking to ourselves and becoming fearful and anxious and worried and stressed out, we are to look to God and to God alone. And what Paul is teaching us here is that we need to be honest about the cares and the concerns of our life. So here's another spiritual reality for us tonight, today. Trusting God at all times doesn't mean you can't be honest with God about all things. Paul is teaching us to pour our hearts out, to empty it out. And sometimes I think as a Christian we say, well, I, I can't God, tell God how I'm really feeling. He will, he will think poorly of me if I do that. Can I let you in on just a little secret? He already knows. You're not hiding anything from him. It's when you and I get honest about it. Lord, I know I shouldn't, but right now I feel like you've forgotten me. 
It's okay to say that and then allow him to begin to move in response to you being honest and pouring your heart out. The psalmist said it in Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And this is exactly what Paul is teaching us here in Philippians chapter 4. That phrase, pour your, or, out your heart, it's the idea of taking something and literally turning it upside down. And in these moments, when you're wanting to be anxious, when you're wanting to worry, when life seems overwhelming, instead run to your Father. Get honest with Him. Pour out your emotion. It's okay to say, I'm angry. It's okay to say, God, I'm frustrated. It's okay to say, God, I feel forgotten. It's okay to say, God, I feel all alone. You can pour your heart out to Him. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, turn the vessel of your soul upside down in his secret presence and let your inmost thoughts, desires, sorrows, and sins be poured out like water. Hide nothing from him, for you can hide nothing. The fourth must is this. I must be intentional about thanking God in stressful situations that tempt me to become anxious. Be anxious for nothing. That's one option. Here's a, another option. In everything, every detail, by prayer, by talking to God in supplication, letting him know your needs, letting him know your requests, let him be known to God. But don't miss, don't miss this. Look what he said. With thanksgiving. And you're saying to yourself, Pastor, I'm in a difficult, stressful, challenging situation that looks beyond my capacity. What am I to be thankful for? Here's what you're to be thankful for this morning. What God is going to do. What God is going to do. Here's the spiritual reality. Difficult and stressful situations in your life are simply opportunities for God to show his faithfulness. He's promised that he's going to be faithful. Let that sink in. And if that's true, why are we so freaked out over the situation? The scripture says, faithful is he who called you and will bring it to pass. It's like the disciples who were out on that boat, that boat there at, the, uh, at the, the lake uh, there of Galilee, or Sea of Galilee, and the storm came up and they, and they got all freaked out about that. And Jesus was already asleep in the boat. Why? Before they got in the boat, do you remember what he told his disciples? He said, let's go to the other side. Let's go. Let's go to the other side, which meant, which meant, we're going to the other side, all right? So when the storm came up and made it look like they weren't going to the other side, all the disciples had to do at that moment was to grab a hold of what Jesus had already said. He's already said that we're going to the other side. I know the storm says it doesn't look like it, but God says we are. So just grab every situation in your life that seems challenging and overwhelming and understand it's simply an opportunity for God to show you how faithful he is. And also to those around you how faithful he is. And this is what you can say, God, I thank you. I'm about to experience your faithfulness in this situation that I could not have experienced without this situation. I'm about to learn something about your faithfulness that I could not have learned unless I had this need. And so here's another spiritual reality. Thanksgiving is the greatest weapon you have against anxiety and stress in your life. What I mean by that. You see, the enemy is not all-knowing. He's not omniscient like God. Some of us want to give God, the enemy, more credit and more power than he so rightfully deserves or doesn't deserve. That didn't sound right. But let me tell you how the enemy learns. You ready? The enemy learns by watching us. He learns by watching us. When the enemy knows that a little difficulty and shipwreck in your life can get you over here focused on you and not on Jesus, do you know what he's going to do? 
difficulty after difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. Why? Because he can ruin your testimony to those that are watching you. But when the enemy figures out that difficulty only triggers in you a response to run to the Father and to begin to give him thanks and praise for who he is and what he's about to do, let me tell you what the enemy is going to do. The enemy is going to stop messing with you like that because he knows that's the last thing he wants is you running to Jesus. And I know what some of you are thinking right now, Pastor, I don't feel thankful. Clyde Cranford wrote a book called Because We Love Him. And if you've not read that, he only wrote one book. He died early in life. Because We Love Him is the name of that book. Well, this is what he says. Feelings follow faith. Thus, thankfulness is the result of thanksgiving. Now, don't get me wrong. Thanksgiving is not the result of thankfulness. Thankfulness is the result of thanksgiving. And then he goes on to say, and worry and genuine thankfulness cannot abide in the same heart. You see, when you and I began to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving, a response of thanksgiving, even in difficulty, then God begins to give me a heart of thankfulness. So Malik goes, but don't miss the promise here at the end. He says, do not be anxious about anything. He's saying, yeah, you can do this. Your flesh is going to want you to do this. But he's saying, hey, look, I got a better way. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anybody here want that today? Anybody here want that in their life? I do. You're not going to get there running to self. You're going to get there by running to him, to him pouring out your heart before him, expressing gratitude for what he's already going to do. You can trust God. And notice what it says. When I take this other path, when I choose to run to my father, the peace of God will surpass all understanding. And that talks about what he's going to do for you today. Today, you can have a peace that you cannot explain. It's a peace that doesn't even make sense. Why? Because it's not even your peace. It's not yours. It's God's. It's his peace in you resting and residing and manifesting through your life. It's God's peace. But when he says, what he also says here, what he's going to do for you in the future, he's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will surpass all understanding, but it's also going to guard your heart and your mind. And here's what that means this morning. When I begin to live this out in my life, and not only will it affect you today, but it will begin to be a pattern in your life and a practice in your life. And here's what it's going to do. You're going to set yourself up for victory and peace in the future. In the future there. And he's begun to begin to guard your heart and your mind. No longer will the enemy win in those areas of your life. You begin to experience victory through Christ. And friends, that's the secret that Paul was trying to tell us and is telling us today. And it can be yours through Jesus. Father, we're thankful this morning. Lord, that we can know you. And we've, we can know you because of what Jesus has done. And because we know you, we can live in fellowship and in, in daily relationship with you. But, Lord, that we can also bring everything that's laying on our heart before you, and we can be honest with you. And today and this morning, Lord, we want to be honest with you. And, Father, I pray that if there's someone here today who does not know Jesus, Lord, that today would be their day. Father, that you'd give them the courage to step out in faith, and to trust you with their life, leading you each and every way, knowing, Lord, that you are a good, a righteous, a holy God, and have our best interests of mind, and you don't make any mistakes. Father, I pray that you give my friends the courage to do that today. But Lord, maybe here today, those of us who do know Christ, peace seems to be far away from our hearts and our minds. God, I pray that today that We will seek your face so that you will guard our hearts and our minds, that we would live a life of thanksgiving. And Father, as we live that life of thanksgiving, Lord, that it will create a 
sense of thankfulness in our hearts. Father, we're going to trust you in all things. And Father, we pray that during this time, Lord, that you, that you do a work in our hearts that only you can do. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you don't know Jesus, I'm going to be standing right here. I want to invite you to come this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus and there's some things that you need to pour your heart out before the Lord today, you do that on these altars. And whatever God is leading you to do as we stand together and sing, you do that this day. Let's stand together. Lift up in Christ alone. My hope is found. In Christ alone. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what a heights of Amen. Always, always good to see your faces. If you hadn't had a chance to worship through giving this morning, our offering boxes are at each door. Get your offering and drop that in the box. But also can, on those boxes are connection cards. If you're a guest with us, please take a time. And we ask you just to fill that out, drop it in the offering box. But it also has a portion at the bottom here of prayer requests. And just want to encourage you, if you give us the honor of praying for you as a staff, we'd love to be able to do that. Just drop that in the box as well. A couple of announcements to make for you today. One is that we have no Wednesday night activities this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. So uh, if you come up here on Wednesday at six o'clock, you may be by yourself. That's all I can tell you. Also, as a church, uh, we are in the process of looking for a new lawn and groundskeeper. Ours retired. And so the properties committee is asking if you are interested to please contact the church office and so that they can begin you in that process. Uh, Turkey Bowl this afternoon at two o'clock. It's not going to be on the practice field, but it on the on the bright lights, big city field. Okay, that's what I was told just a little while ago. So we get uh, Coach Matt's been diligent. He was out there to three o'clock this morning getting it ready for us. <laughs> he picked his app up on his phone and started cutting grass. Is what he did. <laughs> But that'll be at 2 o'clock, and it'll be over parents by 5.30. They're going to eat at 4.30. Everything will be over by 5.30. Um, we're going to take about a three-minute break and have our monthly family meeting. I know that the financial statements are at the door. If you would like one, you can go pick those up. We're going to take a three-minute break, but I'm going to pray for us before we're dismissed. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for a chance to gather, uh, to be able to enjoy the family, Lord, that you have given us. And Lord, each one of us in this room are dealing with different things. But Lord, it is good to know that we can know you and that we can come to you and we can lay those things before you. And Father, we pray and I'm thankful, Lord, that we have those opportunities in our life uh, to give you thanks because of the things that you're going to do. And Father, may that be what we desire and what we pursue each and every day. Father, be with us as we continue to go. Lord, lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Every high and every low Remind me once again